We're talking about pollution, we're talking about health, we're talking about global errors, we're talking about different areas where we can improve our life and keep and save the world we're living in. We're talking about um, the, warm, the warming of the globe and what can we possibly do to change the situation. Let me at this time invite to the stage David Banit, the CEO and co-founder of NCF. NCF are the initials of new CO2 fuels in Israel startup that contributes to this environment developing a system and convert CO2 into synthetic fuels. David. David Banit is... Could you believe it? Can we actually convert CO2 into energy? We can. You'll tell us all about it. David is what? Does it work? <laughs> uh, your microphone. Well, your microphone will be working in a minute. David is what we often call a serial entrepreneur. We usually see him everywhere. Uh, with over 30 years of experience in high tech and clean tech industry, David, the, the stage is all yours. tuned balance of the carbon cycle in our atmosphere. 150 years ago, man began to disrupt this delicate system. Since the Industrial Revolution, our evolving lifestyle has led to the increased burning of fossil fuels and accelerated carbon emissions. Today, climate change poses an imminent threat to the world as we know it. We are witness to unusual changes in weather patterns, a rising sea level, and an increase in the number of heat waves and life-threatening droughts. As climate change disrupts the balance of nature, the entire world population, all seven billion of us, can feel the negative effects on our lives. We have created this problem. Now we must be the ones to find a solution for the benefit of the next generations. <clears throat> And we at NCF, we decided to take the lead in dealing with this uh, immense problem by assuming responsibility and developing a system, a product that will reduce CO2, reduce CO2 emissions, and unlike other technologies in the world, will generate revenues. We believe that uh, solving a problem is not by the stick approach. We prefer the carrot. 40 billion tons of CO2, 40 billion tons of CO2 are emitted by mankind every year. This is a very large problem that cannot be disposed of inexpensively. You'd rather do something useful out of it. And this is what exactly we do. Trees and plants are the natural CO2 absorbers, if you like, and their performance is really poor between 5 to 50 kilograms per year at very low efficiency, 0.002%. How can you deal with $40 billion per year? A decade ago, Professor Carney from the Weizmann Institute of Science asked himself exactly this question. How do you find a way, a mechanism, a, a process that will increase CO2 decomposition, processing rate, higher efficiency? This is what he started to work on. And similarly to the plants and trees that are using sun as their source of energy, his concept was based on solar energy as well. The process is a novel combination of chemical, thermal, electrical uh, processes. And what you can see here at the, the uh, dotted line above is the amount of energy that is required to decompose CO2. One mole of CO2 is about 280 kilojoules. And what you see is the, the, the different energies that are required. Part is heat and part is electricity. And you see the dependence on the breakdown on the temperature. So the farther you go to the right, the higher temperature you have, you need less electricity and you can use more heat. And since the original idea is to take the energy from the sun which is heat, and from it you produce electricity, so you have the toll of inefficiency. So the more you use heat and less you need 
electricity, the more efficient your system is. Now, the basic concept is using these uh, mechanisms in order to destabilize the CO2 uh, molecules and enable them to give away one oxygen ion. And then the oxygen ions are crossing the membrane and generating another separate oxygen stream. So what you're left is, on one side, a stream of oxygen, and the other one, a stream of CO. But if you do that at the same time with water, so the oxygen ions are crossing as well, so you are left with one oxygen stream on one side and hydrogen and CO on the other. Hydrogen and CO is a mixture called syngas. It's a very potent fuel. At 2011, about four years ago, we signed an agreement with IEDA, the commercial arm of the Whiteman Institute of Science, under which we received the license, exclusive license, to use the technology on a worldwide basis. At the same time, we signed an agreement, an investment agreement, with two Australian companies, Erdi Group and Green Earth Energy, to fund our activity. Now, the main challenge that we face at the very beginning is how do you transfer the know-how, the brain, the technology, the details, from the academia labs to your company. So what we did is a couple of things. One, we hired the two PhD guys that worked on that specific technology from J Professor Jacob Carney's team, and they are employees number one and two in the company. The second is we engaged with Professor Carney himself, and he advises us as a consultant, as a chief technology officer of the company. And the third is that from the very beginning, we continue to fund further research at the Weizmann lab so further development and further researches could be implemented in our product at a later stage. Now, no offense uh, about academic people, but there is a very large gap between what a researcher thinks this is a proven technology and what an engineer thinks this is a working technology. There is a gap. And in order to avoid mistakes and loss of money, what you do is you don't run immediately and build large-scale prototype, but rather you build what we call a technology proof or proof of concept. It is a small-scale uh, device. So what you do, you step up from a small uh, or small devices, handmade, very expensive, very low efficiency, low reliability, sorry, and you step up to an industrial small-scale prototype but uses many devices using industrial means and uh, commercial materials based on which you can really make economic analysis and projections to see that the product is eventually commercially viable. This proof of concept is a very challenging one in a well-defined time and limited budget. You have to bring all your engineering resources and to define the product uh, according to the market needs. You have to find people from a variety of uh, companies from different disciplines, cast them into a working team and staff and prove as fast as you can that the concept really work. And we actually did it and built and tested successfully two uh, working uh, proof of concept devices. So the devised uh, technology, eventually, you can look at it as a reverse combustion. We take CO2, we take water, that are the products of combustion, actually, and we enter into our system energy, preferably, of course, renewable energy, solar or other, and we extract the oxygen and left with the syngas. Now, syngas is a building block of many materials, and these materials can be produced using available technologies, so we don't have to invent anything new here. You can see fuels, chemicals, fertilizer, plastics, etc. All these can be done from, uh, from uh, syngas, and the only difference in between is the ratio between the hydrogen and CO, which we can control. So where do you take the CO2 from? Where do you take the energy from? I'll give you the answer. What you see here is the set of reactors representing our product. And unfortunately, we mentioned 40 billion tons of CO2 per year, so sources are many. About 40% of these are emitted by power generation uh, plants, 9% from the steel industry. And just by accident, you know that the steel industry should be actually called 
CO2 industry because for every ton of steel, they produce 1.8 tons of CO2. Now, in those, these two industries, and there are others, such as glass industry, gasification, and others, cement, um, in these industries, the CO2 is mixed with other gases in the flue gas, such as nitrogen, etc. So you have to extract the CO2 out of that. But there are other sources, other sources that emit pure, uh, pure CO2. Anyone want to guess how much CO2 is in gas wells? When you pump a gas from gas wells, there are a lot of CO2. Well, it depends between two and a half, to, uh, even less than that, several percentage, up to 50% in Indonesia, for example. Now, in the system, in the uh, distribution system of gas, you're not allowed to have more than two and a half percent. So what they do, they extract the CO2 and they emit it, they vent it free, 98, 99% uh, pure. So we don't have problems with CO2 sources. What about energy? Well, we started with the solar, if you remember, and surprisingly, during the last several years that we work, we found many other sources of heat, very surprisingly, because people didn't believe, but it is. The steel industry, for example, is wasting a lot of heat. A five million tons of steel plant emits 500 megawatts of heat constantly. Out of these 200 megawatts are at temperatures that are higher, higher than 1,000 centigrade. So that's, that's a lot. So there is enough heat and there is enough uh, CO2. And from that, we produce the steam gas to a variety of materials, as we mentioned before. So we have proven the concept. We have the technology. We have the license. Everything is ready. What next? You can't run to the, product, to the market yet. You still have to prove that it works in industrial environment. And this is exactly what we do. Uh, what you see here is the uh, design of our uh, pilot that will be eventually deployed and installed in the industry. What you can see here is two reactors like that. And each of them is processing CO2 and producing steam gas. Anyone wants to guess how many trees is it, it is equivalent each of these reactors? The size is about one and a half meter diameter and one and a half meter height. No guesses. Between 2,000 and 5,000 trees. And it's also equivalent to about three kilometers of ocean that absorbs CO2. So it's quite compact and quite efficient. We are talking with customers, potential customers, potential partners, and we hope that in these very days, one of these will be signed off and we'll be able to deploy the pilot and test it in the commercial and industrial environment. Ventures such as us, such as NCF, that have global impact need the uh, collaboration of uh, industry, of academia, of uh, institutions, of, of, of the industry itself, and sorry, the institution, and also government. And we were fortunate to, be, to have all these ingredients uh, within us and fortunate also to be awarded by uh, the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of Economics of Israel and also the Bird Foundation. And we hope that we'll go on and be funded and assisted. But your role as uh, future academic people uh, is not ended while giving the first idea. It's an ongoing process. And we believe that further development and further improvement of our processes will uh, being embedded eventually in our future products. Now, I would like to, you to take with me a moment and close your eyes and imagine, imagine a desert with a clear sky, such as it's outside now, very hot. Clear sky in the desert with hundreds or thousands of mirrors with our reactors in the front, tracking the sun from dawn to dusk, producing fuel, from solar energy and CO2 absorbed from the atmosphere. This is our vision. Uh, upon our success, we believe that that will enable mankind to produce fuel from air and sun and help our economy. Thank you. Save the world, David Benit. and reducing CO2 emissions and uh
Save the world, keep the world cleaner and positive. Uh, Thank you. You're the only, there's so much going on. We hear so much about this, uh, this area, this field. You're the only company working on it. You must be having some competition going on. It's a very good question, of course. Of course not. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, green, greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions is well known, and decomposing of CO2 is well known as an idea. But the breakthrough that we have is that you can do it efficiently and generate revenues. And as far as we are aware, we are the only company that have a product that can be profitable without any incentives. Okay, so before letting David go, if there is someone, we're going to use uh, your presence here today, and Professor Shashua is already back here, to get uh, one question for each of you uh, from the crowd. Did you guys have any question? One question? You. You were the first to raise a question. If you stand up and uh, say your name, you will get the microphone. Hi, I'm Jonathan from Israel. I wanted to know what do you get when you burn the thin gas? Excuse me? When what? you burn the gas that is produced from yes. your... Uh, if you burn rock. the thin gas? Yeah. Well, you get water and CO2 uh, immediately back. The same. This is the, the reverse process that we do. Okay. Was said there, Jonathan? Okay. You're happy? <laughs> Looks like you're not happy with, with the, the answer. Red, with like the like inefficiency of the combustion, you get mm -hmm. the energy back. Okay. That was quick. We're going to take one more question for David. Just one more question for David. Okay, anyone? Yes, there was anyone. somebody yeah, here. Yeah, go ahead. You are? Ika from Ika. Finland. And Finland. if you burn the thin gas, you get CO2. So uh, how, does this, uh, how does this help the climate uh, <laughs> with... Uh, uh, if it, uh, if it takes CO2 and then it makes new CO2 from the old CO2, how does this help uh, the climate? Because we recycle it instead of using fossil fuel and adding but more and more CO2. But if you take it from the uh, atmosphere... Uh, Renewable energies, this is the answer. Do you really get it... Uh, so effective that it works. So works. If it works, yes, it works. It, wor <laughs> it works still in our proof of concept, which we did uh, last year, and we are now in the stage of moving it forward to the. Uh, Ika, it works pilot. here. Give us, give David more time. It will work in Finland too. Trust me. We'll get it to you to swarm me. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shashua.